Ethan. here. You may remember me from such things like Cat Fresh Start, Helping Out at Extra Life, and Badly Miming in the Worship Group on Sunday mornings. Um, just wanted to say hi. Um, hope everyone's keeping safe. Um, missing being able to see everyone and, and seeing actual people. Um, 
but I've really enjoyed the videos that people have been putting up before services on Sunday morning, so I thought I would do one myself. So hope everyone's staying safe and um, hopefully see you all soon. church. Um, low means an awful lot to me and I miss seeing you every Sunday and Wednesday and, and Mondays and Thursday nights. Uh, it's a real blessing to be able to do what I'm doing and I want to say thank you for letting me do it. I uh, hope you're all staying safe. I'm unfortunately back at work on Monday um, but with social distancing. Um, stay safe and um, God bless you all.
Hi, it's the 31st of May, the sun is shining, and I don't know about you, but I feel so encouraged by this great weather. Um, you're very welcome to Low Live. We hope you will be blessed through this service of worship together this morning. Uh, whether you're near or whether you're far away uh, around the globe, we don't know, we don't mind. It's great to have you at Low Live. Now, I love worshiping God. I'm going to ask Josh to lead us in a song, followed by Bronwyn in a children's talk. Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're all well. 
I have a few guests with me this morning that I would like to introduce you to. So I'm just going to move my camera along to let you see. The first one is Ralph, the rugby player, and he plays for Ulster. The second guest I have is Fernando, the footballer, and he plays for Real Madrid. And next to Fernando, we have Fiona, who is a hockey player. Perhaps you can see her hockey stick. And she plays for a local team called KV. And they've each got some trophies with them as well. A rugby trophy, a football trophy, and a hockey trophy. So boys and girls, what do you think my guests have in common? Well, you're probably saying they all play sport, which is absolutely correct. But they have another thing in common that is even more important that I would like to talk to you about today. And that is that they play for a team. And I know that many of you belong to teams, whether it be football or rugby or netball, basketball, or maybe music teams such as the school choir or the school orchestra. A lot of us belong to teams. And there's a lot of advantages of being in a team. Can you think of any? Well, we can get a chance to meet up with our friends. We can learn new skills and practice those skills. We can even compete in competitions like big tournaments to win trophies like my guests, Ralph, Fiona and Ferdinand. And it's great to be in a team because we get to learn lots of instruction from our coach who is our leader. And he gives us guidance and instruction to learn new skills and how to improve on those every week. Now, some teams we have to audition for or, or trial for, isn't that right, boys and girls? Because sometimes there's not enough places in a team to allow us all to get into it. So we have to be judged on the basis of our skills to see if we could join the team. And sometimes that leads to a little bit of disappointment if we don't get on the team first time. But there's one team that I want to talk to you about today that you do not have to trial for. In fact, you don't even have to go and ask to get on this team. You are actually automatically invited to join this team. Can any of you think of whose team this is? Yes, it's God's team. When we're born, God sends an invitation to all of us that we can automatically join his team. It doesn't matter if we're good at sums, if we're good at drawing, if we're musical, if we're sporty, it doesn't matter about anything like that. We are all equal in God's eyes and he wants us to join his team. All we have to do is trust in Jesus, his son, and ask Jesus to come into our hearts because Jesus is our saviour. Now, there's many examples, boys and girls, of people in the Bible who were part of God's team and how being on God's team enabled them to get through some very difficult and challenging times and in fact, to defeat a lot of enemies in battles. And there's so many stories, it was difficult for me to choose one but I thought a really good example was the one where Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt. The Israelites had been slaves in the land of Egypt for over 400 years and they had to work very hard in some very difficult conditions and they got really sick and tired of being slaves. God heard their pleas and their cries and he appointed Moses to go to Pharaoh and ask if they could leave Egypt. Of course, Pharaoh said no. In fact, Pharaoh said no 10 times. God sent 10 different plagues to Egypt to try and soften Pharaoh's heart and persuade him to let the Israelites go. And at the very last, whenever the last 10th plague was imposed on the Egyptians, which was to kill the firstborn in every family, Pharaoh had finally had enough. He just wanted rid of the Israelites and their God. So Moses was able to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But not long after they had left, 
Pharaoh's heart hardened again and he decided to take his army of men and pursue the Israelites to capture them. By the time they caught up with the Israelites, the Israelites had uh, arrived at the Red Sea. But what were the Israelites to do? The Israelites didn't have any weapons to fight the Egyptians with. Here they were, stuck between a sea and the army of Egyptians. What were they going to do? They couldn't cross the sea. They didn't have any boats. Do you think they gave up on God? Do you think they cried out and said, God, why have you forsaken us? No, they trusted in God because they knew that God would look out for them. So God told Moses to raise his staff high over the seas and the seas opened up. They parted to either side and they allowed the Israelites to walk through on the riverbed over to the other side. Now, when Pharaoh's army saw this, Pharaoh gave the command to follow the Israelites across the sea. But what they didn't bank on was that once the Israelites had actually reached the other side, God caused the sea to come in again and they covered the Egyptians with water and all of the Egyptian army was drowned. Now, isn't that a wonderful story, boys and girls, of being on God's team? The Israelites had just left the land of Egypt with the clothes they stood in and maybe a few extra bits and pieces, but they didn't have any weapons. They didn't have any real goods to their name. They just left under the trust of God. And that's what we have to do today, boys and girls. We have to trust God because God looks out for us. Now, there's a great verse in the Bible that I want to share with you today. And it's John chapter 16, verse 33. And I'm going to hold it up and read it out. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples after he had um, risen from the dead. What exactly does it mean? Well, it means in this world, we will all have trouble. That is definite. It's not a maybe, it's definite. Sometimes things don't go our way, but take heart. That means don't worry because God is on our side. Jesus overcame the world when he died for our sins on the cross and he defeated the devil and he defeated death. And equally, God the Father created the world. He is bigger than the world. So he has overcome the world. And if we are on God's side, and God is, we are in God's team, we can get through all the challenging times that this world throws us. And these words are particularly important at the moment, boys and girls, when we find ourselves in this lockdown where our common enemy is the coronavirus. We can't see it. We don't have any weapons to fight it, but it is our enemy. But take heart, listen to Jesus' words. Jesus and God are on our side. We are in God's team. And if we trust in God and read our Bible and pray, God will lead us through this pandemic and out the other side. I don't know about you boys and girls, but I definitely am in God's team and there's no other place I'd rather be, particularly at the moment. And I hope that's where you want to be as well. Pray that you are on God's team because God loves you and it is the best team to be in. And just like Ralph and Fiona and Fernando who have won trophies, God gives us the best prize in the world, the ultimate prize, and that is the prize of eternal life. The prize that we will go to heaven after we die. And that is the best gift that anyone can give us. So just remember, let's all be on God's team because that's the best place to be. Now, I have a competition for um, this week, boys and girls, 
and it's based on Thames and it is to draw a picture of a t-shirt and design what you might um, put on that t-shirt uh, to be on God's team. So I have an example of a t-shirt that we wear at the open day. Can you all see it? So on this team, on this t-shirt, it says Low Memorial and it has a cross. And the cross signifies Jesus dying for our sins. So if all of you could just draw a picture of a t-shirt on a page, I'm not asking you to decorate a real t-shirt, just draw a t-shirt on a page and draw it whatever color, color it in whichever colors you want. It could be multicolored like Joseph's multicolored dream coat. It could be bright yellow, bright blue, whichever color you want. You can write verses on it if you like. Uh, you could put a cross on it. You could put a rainbow on it. You could put lots of pictures on it. And if you can send that in to admin at low.church by Wednesday, if possible, please, that would be great. In the meantime, have a lovely day and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Good morning. Today's reading is from Esther chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the, the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to Josh and Broman. Uh, thank you for that great competition, Broman, and also to Ellen for reading God's word for us this morning. And uh, children, you can go off and, and follow that competition. I hope you have a great day and we'll get outside as well, I'm sure. Let us pray together. Let's invite the Lord. I don't know what week you've had, whether it's been a good week, a bad week, an indifferent week, another week of lockdown, but let's invite the Lord now to come and to meet with us as we prepare to listen to the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to meet together, Lord. We thank you that you're present with us in our lives. And we invite you, Lord, to come and speak to us. We invite you, Lord, to be at the, the center of our lives and our homes. Lord, be with us in this crisis. And might you have a word for us today that will encourage us and inspire us as we all seek to live through these times, Lord, to the best of our ability, trusting in the Lord, encouraged by you, Lord, and led by you. So we invite you, Lord, to come and speak to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I was growing up, I, I wasn't one for fairy tales. I don't know why, I just didn't really enjoy them. But as an adult, uh, one has really caught my attention. Now, it is a bit silly, um, but bear with me. Um, this is a fairy tale that's been developed in order to sell things to people like me. Uh, it's a marketing tool. Uh, so the, the story I want to share is by Alexander Orloff, and it's called A Simple's Life. Uh, you may have seen these little meerkats on the TV. So this is the history of the fairy tale. So just bear with me uh, for one moment. Sometimes this is about his ancestor, Kefensi. Sometimes when Kefensi would return from a hunt, he would invite meerkats from miles around to join their feast. They would come with warm worm puddings and bottles of beetle juice. Together they would roast scorpions in the fire as the mere pups played on their barrow sleighs. On nights like this, Kefensi would look out across the plains and think, ours is a simple's life. What could possibles go wrong? Then, one fateful day, disaster struck. At least in this fairy tale for adults, uh, it's realistic to know that fairy tales uh, don't really exist. We all face challenges in the story they sadly face famine. For you and me, we're living through the worst pandemic in 100 years. 
And out of that pandemic, I imagine we all face our own little personal struggles and battles every day, as well as the big battle of COVID-19. Um, in this situation, of course, if you give up on fairy tales, it's very easy to give up on optimism. But really, God doesn't want you to give up on optimism. Instead, he wants us to be optimistic by being realistic but all about our circumstances, but also believing in what's possible, what God might do, how God might deliver us, how God might step in and rescue us. There's a, a verse, a word from God I'd love to share with you today. It's a sentence, it's a, a word that would have been taught to Jewish kids when they were young in the Old Testament. It's found in multiple places across the Old Testament. And here is the verse. The battle belongs to the Lord, children. That, that's what they would have been taught as kids. And I think we need to learn this verse this morning. The battle belongs to the Lord. You may be in the fight, but it's the Lord who will give you the victory. That's what it means. The battle belongs to the Lord. And as I look at Esther, and we've been following Esther over the last number of weeks, Esther's in a battle. But the battle will belong to the Lord. And we have a lot to learn from her as we think about our own lives and our own struggles in this terrible pandemic. Uh, before we look at what we can learn, let me give you the recap. This is Esther, the mystery catcher. Last week, we, we saw how Esther was willing to risk everything in order to step out in faith and play her part in saving the world. And she called her friends, she called her family, she called all Jews around the whole world to fast and pray for her for three days before she stepped into the battle. Let me give you a recap uh, by reading chapter 4 uh, again. And this is uh, really the, the battle that she's about to step into, the fight that God has asked her and called her to step into. All the king, Verse uh, 11, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter. To them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So 30 days is a month. She's not the flavor of the month anymore. The king has not asked her uh, to come into his company or presence for 30 solid days in a row. So, you know, she's not exactly uh, the flavor of the month. And yet she has to go into his presence uninvited, which carries a mandatory death sentence unless... He who holds up this great big spear or gold scepter and grants uh, grace or forgiveness so that you can come and talk to him. That's the battle that Esther has to step into. You know, I, I feel sorry for Esther. I often wonder, was she someone who thought, well, I won this somewhat called a beauty contest. It was a bizarre contest. I won the contest and I got to marry the king. And was she expecting a fairy tale marriage? Well, she didn't get one, and that's very obvious in the story. Fairy tales don't really exist. Now we come to today's episode five, and it's called The Battle Belongs to the Lord. So how can we live our lives so that the battle belongs to the Lord? Well, here's what we learn from Esther. First, the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord when we wear the right clothes. Now, I, I know that sounds a bit strange, but let me read uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 1. And this is what we, we discover. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Did you notice it says when Esther went in to see the king, she changed her clothes. For five days, she's been wearing what's called sackcloth, which are pretty dull and uncomfortable clothing, a sign of repentance, a sign of seeking the Lord. For three days, she's worn those clothes. But to go in to see the king, she takes those clothes off and she puts on her royal robes. Over the last few months, I haven't bought any new clothes. I, maybe you're the same. The only thing I've actually bought is a pack of 50 surgical masks. And, and just in case, I haven't used them yet, um, but they're there just in, in case. I haven't bought any new clothes. But here's what I want to say. Whenever we step into a battle, 
Whenever we face a challenge, we must make sure we're wearing the right clothes. I don't mean literal clothes. I mean what Paul talks about, uh, the clothes of righteousness uh, or the character of Jesus. One of the amazing things about the cross is that when we encounter Jesus at the cross and he forgives our sins, it's such a life transforming experience to, to be in contact, to, to be in contact with Jesus, that he starts to change us. We start to adopt his character. We, we start to wear his patience, his kindness, his love, his goodness. In fact, Jesus says, whenever you know me, it's like becoming a new person. It's like being born again. John's Gospel, chapter three. It's like being born again. We're meant to wear the character of Jesus when we step into a battle. I've been reading about Premiership footballers this week, and uh, I, I was um, really encouraged to read about how many Premiership footballers actually follow Jesus. And one of them, uh, Michael Johnson, is the current under-21 England national manager. He's a committed Christian, and in the article I read about lots of Premiership footballers and elite athletes, and what they're doing right now in this crisis is they're having Zoom meetings. And they're sharing together the Word of God, and they're having fellowship. And this is what Michael Johnson says about his time when he was a professional footballer and a, as a Christian. He said, there were players who, if the ball went out and I shouted it was in, would say, Jono, you can't lie. You have to tell the truth because you're a Christian. And Christians are meant to carry the character of Jesus. They're meant to wear the character of Jesus. I wonder today, as we, we go through this COVID-19, as we face this battle uh, together as a church family, or, or maybe you have other battles and challenges in your life, are, are you wearing the right clothes? Are you clothed in the character of Jesus Christ? Well, perhaps this morning we need to visit the cross again. I, I love what Paul says. Paul says the cross is like a, a changing room. Uh, and we go to the cross and we take off our filthy rags. We take off our sins. We take off our pride. We take off our anger, our jealousy, our envy, whatever it is. We, we hang it on the cross. And then we turn to the other side and we take down from the cross the garments of grace, garments of forgiveness, garments of love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We're reclothed. Perhaps this morning you're listening to this talk and what, what you need most uh, in your life at the moment is to spend time in the changing room of the cross, to be clothed in the character of Jesus. Maybe you've never come to Jesus. Maybe you, you, you have yet to meet Jesus. Well, similarly, if you go to the cross, put your sins in the cross, ask him to forgive you, he will clothe you in forgiveness. That's the wonderful message of the cross of Jesus Christ. So the battle belongs to the Lord when we wear the right clothes. Second thing, the battle belongs to the Lord when we're led by the Spirit. It's a curious story, really. And she goes in to see the king, the, the gold scepters touched down, she touches it, come and talk to me, my, my wife is really what he says. And, and when she goes to see him, she makes the most curious um, request. She says, if you and the prime minister would like to join me for dinner, have you ever wondered why she makes that request? Instead of saying, getting on her knees and pleading, please help the Jews, please cancel the law that you've just passed. Well, I rather suspect that Esther is being led by the Holy Spirit and she uses the gift of the Holy Spirit that God has given to her, which is the gift of hospitality. And in this moment in the story, what she does is she changes the terms of the battle. She doesn't fight the battle on Haman's terms, which is hatred and intertribal bitterness, the same terms that Mordecai fought the battle on. Instead, she changes the terms to God's terms. She uses the gift of the Holy Spirit that God gave to her, the gift of hospitality. Never underestimate the gift of hospitality. The Lord Jesus used hospitality all the time. He would have meals with all kinds of people uh, because he believed he could make enemies into friends. I, I love the story of South Africa at the time when the apartheid ended. Um, do you know the story? 
uh, Christians um, worked hard to get um, white extremists together along with ANC members and others in that whole political spectrum. And they got them together and they got them to eat together and spend time together and do leisure together. And old enemies start to become friends. And what's so incredible about the story of apartheid is that not one person was killed in that election that abolished apartheid for good. And I say amen to that. In Northern Ireland, uh, towards the end of the Troubles, similar things, I'm told, happened. The opposing politicians and leaders were brought together for meals, spent time together, just to go for a walk together, turning enemies into friends. What Esther does in this story is she moves, she moves the terms of the battle. She moves it away from hatred and inter, inter-tribal warfare onto God's terms, led by the Spirit, using the gifts of the Spirit. Let's have a listen in uh, to see uh, what happens next uh, in the story. So chapter 5, and we read uh, verse 5. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request... Let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer. Then I will answer the king's question. Why does she do that? Why does she delay? Um, She gets them together. The meal goes well. And then instead of, you know, getting it out, speaking it out, um, she delays for another day. Why does she do that? You know, the scholars I've read, uh, nobody seems to know. Nobody can come up with an answer uh, as to why. We can speculate. My suggestion, why she delays, is because she's being led by the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit has said to her, wait, wait, not today. Invite them back tomorrow. Wait. You know, it's a, an amazing idea that, that the wait is important. And, and as I think of Haman, a terrible man, an awful enemy. I can't help think, think about the gospel of Jesus. You know the gospel where Jesus gives people second and third and fourth and 70th chances. And I think to myself, is this God giving Haman a second chance? Is this God giving this man more time? God gave Pharaoh 10 chances after all, if you read that story. Is God doing that with Haman? You know, Haman's bad character will not affect God's good character. God is good. God is gracious and God is kind. He's the God who gives people second chances. It would not surprise me if God turned around to this, in our eyes, despicable little man and gave him another chance. It would not surprise me at all. The God I believe in is a God of second chances. The God I believe in is a God a God of grace, the God I worship is the God who has given me a second chance and a third one and a fourth one. Maybe today God is giving you a second chance. Maybe today God is opening up his arms to you and saying, come to me for the first time or or come back to me for the 70th time. God is a God of second chances. The artist Little Richard, uh, famous throughout the world, regarded as one of the fathers or the father of rock and roll, had a very turbulent life. Uh, At one stage, he trained to be a pastor, and he was a pastor in the church. Then he went back into the rock and roll lifestyle. Then he came back to faith. Then he went back into the rock and roll lifestyle. And it went like that for little Richard throughout his entire life. But the Lord didn't give up on him. The Lord kept giving him more chances. And I'm delighted to say that that when he died, he, he was serving the Lord Jesus. I heard his last sermon, the very the start of it at least. And at the start of this sermon, little Richard said, I believe in Jesus. You've got nothing unless you've got Jesus. An amazing moment to listen to that testimony from such an amazing man of history. 
God is a God of second chances. So for me, Esther in this story is being led by the Spirit of God. She uses the gift of hospitality to change the terms of the battle. And then she waits on the Lord. She listens and waits on the Lord. She, she postpones because the Lord tells her to. Maybe you're in a battle today. Maybe it's COVID-19 or maybe it's a very different kind of battle or challenge. Well, you need to be led by the Spirit of God if you want the battle to belong to the Lord. You can't win the battle if you go out in your own strength. If you take a notion and go off and do this, that, or the other thing. You need to be led by the Spirit of God. And there are times when the Spirit will say to you, not yet, not now, wait, give me room in order to work on your behalf. Far too easily we rush in and try to do God's work for him. I would encourage you today, don't do that. Let's be led by the Spirit. Listen. Know when to advance, know when to hang back. Allow God to work. Who knows what God is doing in these circumstances right now in COVID-19? Who knows what God is doing in your circumstances right now? We may be in the fight, but the battle and the victory will belong to the Lord. The final thing I want to share with you today is this. The battle belongs to the Lord when we show courage in the face of setbacks. Now, you don't need to be in life all that long as an adult before you face setbacks. Who enjoys setbacks? None of us enjoy setbacks, but setbacks are a part of life. They're a part of faith. In the story, Esther faces a huge setback. She listens and she's led by the Spirit of God to have another, a second banquet the next day. In the meantime, Haman saunters home. He's had a great dinner. He's, had a, he's been drinking. He's had a few drinks. He's in good form and everything's great. And then he looks over and he happens to see um, Mordecai, uh, Esther's adopted father. And that puts him in foul form. He goes home to the wife, uh, Veresh. And he says, you know, I had a great day today. The queen invited me to a private di- luncheon with the king. Everything was going fantastic well until I saw a him, Mordecai. And Varish, the wife, says, dear, dear, don't worry about it. Tell you what you do. Go and organize the building of a great big gallows, 60 feet high. And tomorrow morning, first thing, you get yourself down to that palace. You get permission from the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows. And then you can go off to your dinner and you won't have to worry a thing about him. Don't let him spoil the party. Verse 14, this is how the chapter finishes. His wife, Verish, and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up, reaching to a height of 50 cubits, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the pole set up. Awful, terrible situation. Can you imagine being Esther, and word gets out, what Haman's about to do and how he's going to treat her father, Mordecai, the next day. I would imagine people would be sitting pointing the finger at um, Esther and say, why did you wait? Look at the mess you've created. Look at the setback. I would imagine she would get a lot of criticism because of what's happened in the intervening moment. God gave Haman a second chance, but Haman's heart was as hard as granite. So what do you do? You're in the battle, you're in the fight, and you face a setback even though you believe you're going in the right direction with the Lord, you're following, you're being led by the Spirit, and things don't go well. There there are setbacks in your path. What do you do? I want to encourage you. We need to find courage in the Word of God. We need to find courage in the promises of God. It's the promises of God that that will get us through. And I think of a young Joshua who had to follow in the footsteps of the great Moses. I mean, imagine trying to follow in the footsteps of Moses. And the Lord has a word, a promise to the young Joshua. He says, do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever, wherever you go. Don't be terrified. And and that promise to Joshua gave him courage to be bold in his circumstance, which had a lot of setbacks. Maybe you need that today, to find courage in the word of God and the promises of God. The Bible is like a book of promises for you and for me. Or maybe you need to be encouraged by the witness that the Holy Spirit is in your life, that, that the Lord is the Lord of your life and he's with you and for you and he'll never let you go. You need to find courage from the word of God. We need to not take too seriously 
our circumstances and, and how they look right now. You know, circumstances and people are like chameleons. They're forever changing, whereas God's promises are guaranteed. They'll never change and they'll never fail. Don't cross bridges before you get to them. I often say that to people. Whether that's a negative bridge and a bridge of worry to my left, or whether you've got yourself, you've got something in your head of a, of a fairy tale kind of ending bridge, which maybe is unrealistic. Don't cross bridges before you get to them. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And don't let past failures discourage you. Abraham Lincoln, the American president, uh, started off uh, in a lot of failure. He went as a young man to war as a captain. And uh, such was his military record that he was demoted and became a private. He came back a private. How humiliating uh, for Abraham Lincoln. He, he lost 26 campaigns and he was bankrupt twice in his lifetime before he became president of the United States of America, one of the most important presidents of all time. He won the Civil War. He won the abolition of slavery. How amazing is that achievement? Don't dwell on your past. Don't dwell on past failures. Be encouraged by the word of God and don't give too much focus to your present circumstances. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you at your right hand. He will not falter. He will not let you go. We all face battles. And there are times when God calls us into the fight. But it's he who will bring the victory. This chapter 5 finishes and Esther hasn't had the victory yet. She's in the fight and she doesn't have the victory. And, and really, that's where we are today, isn't it, with COVID-19? We're, we're in the fight, but we haven't got the victory yet. Maybe you have other battles in your life or challenges or setbacks, and, and you haven't got the victory yet. Well, keep fighting. Keep trusting. Keep persevering. Have courage, because the victory will come over COVID-19, and the victory over many other battles will come as well. I've been encouraged to see the, the Bible image of the rainbow in Genesis chapter 6 being put across millions and millions of houses in the United Kingdom and around the world, the picture of hope. And isn't it encouraging to see people take hold of a biblical truth? But what I think we need today, if you're a Christian uh, or if you'd like to become one, is we need to have a slogan written across our hearts. And that slogan is this, the battle belongs to the Lord. You may be in a fight, but it's the Lord who'll win the victory. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word to us today. The battle belongs to the Lord. We are all battling today, Lord. We're battling COVID-19. We're maybe battling personal battles, Lord, because of restrictions and social distancing. We're battling, Lord, in many different fronts, and it is challenging. These are challenging days. But Father, may you impress upon our hearts and our minds this wonderful truth that the battle belongs to the Lord. And Father, may we give you room to win the battle. May we wear the right clothes, the right character. May we be led by the Spirit of God. And may we find courage from your Word and Spirit as we face setbacks and obstacles in our paths. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. What might the Lord be saying to you this morning? How might the Lord be whispering into your heart? Maybe for the first time you need to go to the changing room of the cross and give Jesus your sins so that he can give you his forgiveness, his character, and his righteousness. And maybe you're a believer. And your character suffered a little bit during COVID-19. Patience is a bit short. Maybe you need to go into the changing room of the cross 
and take off some of those garments and put on the new garments of Christ. If you ask him, he'll reclothe you. If you ask him, he'll set you free. Oh, Father, today we join together to pray for our world. Father, we confess we we don't know when this virus is going to end or a vaccine is going to be found, but we pray together, Lord, as we fight in this battle, as governments fight in the battle and frontline workers and staff and police forces and uh, all kinds of different people, nursing home workers and uh, other folk, Lord, as we all fight in this battle. Lord Jesus, we pray for the victory. We pray for your victory in these days. And we pray that that victory will come soon. And Father, we want to pray for anyone today who is suffering pastorally uh, through illness through COVID-19, through cancer, through some other disease. Father, as we fight in the battle, we pray for your victory. May the battle belong to the Lord. Father, I pray for John Dickinson from Carmoney, whose wife died on Friday. Be with that family, Lord. May you be in the center of their grief. Lord, be in the center of all of those who grieve at this time. Father, we pray, we thank you for your word. May we be people who live with this truth written across our hearts. The battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Phil's going to lead us in a song. Though Satan should bow. 
Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you for being with us this morning. I hope you've been blessed. I hope you've been enriched. I hope the Lord has spoken to you. Um, we are shut down as a building, but we're very much open uh, for business, for God's work online. So check out our ministries uh, on our website, on Facebook. We've got a great Alpha course going. Uh, we've got great prayer opportunities and Bible study groups as well, and loads more besides. So uh, don't miss out. Check us out online, uh, Facebook and the website. If you want to receive our newsletters, if you want to be up to date on all that's happening at Lowe, then email our administrator, admin at Lowe.church, and she will add you to our email list. Now, we're back tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's a kind of live lounge, relaxed atmosphere. We talk a little bit more about the text. We take your questions, uh, and then we kind of look more carefully together what the Lord might really want us to take away from today. So that's 7 tonight. Uh, the Zoom opens at 6.45, and if you make contact with us, we can send you the Zoom details. But have a great day. The sun is shining outside, and I hope the rest of this weekend will be a blessing to you all. Thanks.